Hello, everybody. Uh, you are listening to Through Time and Quades. My name is Albert. And I'm Joan. All right. And it is already the month of July. I don't know how that happened. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. Time flies like a bird. Yeah, it really, really does. Um, but I suppose since it is the beginning of the month, uh, we will be doing another news episode about interesting studies related to natural history that we noticed. Um, over the past month or so, or at least a selection of them. Uh, obviously, we don't have time to cover everything we, we read or noticed. Um, but uh, before we start, um, how are you doing this week? Oh, I'm doing pretty good. Um, not much to complain about mm. or, or go deep into. Uh, I've been binging in Practical Jokers and <laughs> just keeping up with readings and things. That's <laughs> really about it. <laughs> what about on your end? <laughs> Uh, it's, you know, sounds like a perfectly good time to me. Um, well, as for me, um, I've been just uh, really busy, I guess. Uh, I keep saying that, but, you know, I'm in the final year of my PhD, so it's kind of a given. Um, yeah, so basically um, this entire week I've just been uh, dealing with a lot of uh, research-related stuff. I'm kind, of, um, uh, kind of at a stage where I'm um, close to finishing collecting all the data I need, but... I'm kind of second guessing myself a lot and wanting to go back and check whether I got this thing right or that thing right. And uh, so I keep doing that. And that, that's pretty much what's been keeping me busy uh, this whole week. Um, but uh, yeah, I think uh, I think it's pretty much just about at a place where I'm, uh, uh, well, I at least think it, it's presentable. So um, I will be um, uh, analyzing that data and um, writing it up very soon which i i need i really need to get done so uh, uh yeah i will be working on that <laughs> oh, excellent excellent um yeah i mean uh, my gosh there's been a lot of big news in the in the past month and um i guess i'll i should just go ahead and throw this out now mm. in case some of our viewers are wondering no we will not be talking about homo longi um at least not yet um <laughs> i know that was like one of the big paleo studies of the past month um yeah a lot of lot to say about that but i don't think we'd have enough time or like it wouldn't be proper to cover it in this episode so mm. i'll certainly talk about it in in a future installment um i don't know if we've mentioned this before i i uh it's been almost a year since the premiere of you know my, my lecture series humanity a prologue and uh, uh, certainly a lot has happened in the world of paleoanthropology in the time that this sh series has been created um and as such there's a, lots of updates that it needs um mm -hmm. as is typical for a field like this which you know it moves like a like a geyser it just <laughs> keeps going and going right. um so well I, I i we 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 would like to do an updates episode for that uh fairly soon mm -hmm. and uh, rest assured i will talk about homo longi then um but until then just kind of have to hold on to your butts <laughs> and uh, we'll, we'll get there when we get there <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> definitely something to look forward to yeah we, we definitely um in our kind of news episodes like this we we like to um we like to look at studies that are you know maybe not uh directly within our immediate fields of focus because there, there's a lot of cool stuff out there and so we we like to highlight uh reasonably wide spectrum of it <laughs> right especially since some of it kind of gets overshadowed by other big studies of course like yeah. homo long day um, <laughs> right and we, we think that you know these are still important things to 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 know and, and should definitely be talked about a lot more mm -hmm. since they're mm -hmm. you know they're fascinating in their own ways absolutely all right so um i guess in that event uh should we get started i think um we're starting with one of your stories this uh, month yeah, that's right. Yeah, let's go ahead and, and jump right into that. Um, so yeah, uh, in this paper uh, by uh, Chang Li and colleagues, uh, we have a new placoderm. Uh, now, before going too deep into that, uh, uh, I don't think we've talked about placoderms yet on the show, have we? Not, yeah, not that I can recall. Definitely not in detail, I think. All righty. So I guess a refresher would be in order for some of our viewers, or I guess in this case, an introduction for some of others. Um, so placoderm is a, well, it's a now now it's a, it's a paraphyletic term for a group of armor-plated fishes that evolved during the late Silurian and they died out in the mass extinctions at the end of the Devonian. Um, 
I say now paraphyletic because mm-hmm. recent studies have indicated that the living jawed vertebrates, uh, what we call nathostomes, evolved from within the placoderm radiation. They were once thought to be two separate lineages. Um, so this would make placoderms stem nathostomes. Um, this was a very diverse group um, featuring all different kinds of lineages of armor-plated fish. Uh, you have, I have a couple listed here, the uh, Antiarchs, uh, which were an early diverging group that tended to swim about on the bottom of rivers, you know, using their tiny jaws to slurp up food. Um, you look at members of this group like uh, Bothriolepis, which is probably the most familiar, and, you know, they don't immediately scream fish to you. Um, I- I've always thought they looked kind of like uh, beetles using crutches. Mm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And, uh, you know, then you have things like uh, tychodonts, uh, which were a little bit more streamlined and they were less armored. Um, so they would have been, you know, faster swimmers. Now, uh, based on the fossils we have from this group, it appears that these fishes, out of all the placoderms that we know about, were actually sexually dimorphic. Uh, the males had these claspers mm. on their pelvic fins, which is kind of similar to what sharks have, but they're not homologous to each other. So they, they don't stem from the same common ancestor. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, those help with mating. Uh, but uh, certainly the most familiar in paleomedia of all the placoderms would have to be the arthrodires, uh, which were very diverse. Uh, some were bottom dwellers like the antiarchs, and, uh, but others grew to just enormous sizes. Uh, two in particular stick out. Um, the predatory Dunkelosteus, mm-hmm. uh, which actually used sharp bony outgrowths from the jaws in place of true teeth to cut up prey, um, kind of like a piece of scissors. Um, and then there's the filter feeding Titanichthys, uh, which had a similar mouth situation to Dunkelosteus, but uh, the outgrowths were actually smaller and not as sharp. Mm-hmm. You can think of it like a, like a whale shark, um, a proto whale shark. Now, both of those fishes could reach sizes of at least eight meters long. Um, but of course that all depends on the proportions of the body uh, we usually only have the bony armor preserved in those fossils mm-hmm. and that's for about the the animal's head um there's a smaller similar looking arthrodire called a coccostus which we have the whole body fossils of um, so researchers have tended to use that to scale up the larger fossils which i think is fair for what we have um I mean, I, I don't reasonably see something like Dunkelosteus looking like an ocean sunfish, for example. Mm. That, would, <laughs> that would be a bit weird. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I hope that was a, a good introduction. Um, but uh, anywho, uh, so we have this new fossil from the latter half of the Silurian uh, period, specifically the uh, Ludfordian age of the Ludlow Epoch. So that's between... 425.6 to 423 million years ago. And it hails from the uh, Zhaoji Formation in uh, Zhushan County, Chongqing, China. Uh, this is uh, Biancengikthes micros, uh, the tiny fish from the Biancheng fossil locality. That's what the name translates as. Uh, we are especially fortunate with this fossil because we have a near complete articulated skeleton. Um, or should I say a dermatoskeleton, uh, because that refers to the, the bony armor that grew out of the skin. Um, these animals didn't have bony skeletons like most of the fish alive today. Mm-hmm. It's a bit distinct. Um, we also have the pectoral fins, and you can see a lot of this in the images here, um, which are very short, and they're covered in scales of two varieties. Now, given the overall proportions of the animal, which you can see reconstructed, especially at the bottom right, wonderful light reconstruction, um, this was likely not a fast-swimming uh, open-water fish, uh, but something more like an antiarch that kind of hung around on the sandy bottoms of whatever water systems it was living in. Um, size-wise, this isn't something impressive like <laughs> Titanic bees. Um, the armor in total spanned two centimeters. Wow. <laughs> which, you know, that would be dwarfed by some species of minnows. <laughs> All right, right. So this is not a not a not a big fish, um, but you know don't let the size fool you. you know, th- this has proven to be a really important find. Uh, the jaws are interesting. Uh, of course, they're fully preserved, so we can see everything in detail, and they show a lot of features 
that are very similar to crown napa stones, mm -hmm. as well as a larger, slightly more recent species of placoderm from Yunnan, China, called Antelognathus primordialis. Mm -hmm. Now, when the fossils of that animal were first announced back in 2013, they were very important in that yep. they proved to be a sister group to crown napa stones based on the characteristics of the jaws. Um, it's the first in the whole lineage to have the modern type jaw bones that we see today. So when researchers looked at uh, Ban Changikthes with its lower jaw teeth and the shape of the mandible, and they plugged it into a phylogenetic analysis, they found that it forms a sister group um, with both Antelognathus and the crown natha stones. So th this basically gives us a really neat sequence from earlier placoderms to modern jawed fishes. Now, Ban Changikthes is similar to other placoderms, um, but unlike the crown growth natha stones, the teeth don't shed or replace. Um, you know, that trait was pioneered by the last common ancestor of the crown natha stones. That, that's, what, that's part of what makes them very special. Yeah. Earlier placoderms didn't have that trait. Um, so uh, the transitional features are really clear in the specimen. Now, uh, given the range of all these different fossils, in addition uh, of, uh, well, the addition of being Chengekthes kind of gives us a, a global context for the evolution of jawed vertebrates. Uh, the small range across present day southern China, where you get most of these early fossils, um, and also the large range of shapes and sizes among this little locality tells us that the immediate ancestors of the crown natha stones were experimenting with different niches in a relatively small area of the world, which is interesting. You know, you're essentially looking at what the authors call a confined region, giving rise to a group that evolved in, you know, into an explosive diversity of forms, mm -hmm. you know, including the tetrapods who would settle the land and take to the skies. So that's what I would call humble beginnings. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah, I think that was a pretty neat little story. What do you think, Albert? Yeah, it's really cool. Um, I definitely think um, kind of the, the discovery that uh, the placoderms are, in fact, uh, paraphyletic uh, is one of the major kind of discoveries regarding early vertebrate evolution that has come about in, I guess, you know, really the past decade, I suppose. Uh, it's, it's a pretty recent kind of thing. And I guess... Um, in case um, anyone hasn't really picked up the implications of that, it, um, historically um, the placoderms are thought to be, you know, kind of uh, all their own group, but they were all closely related to each other, uh, more closely related to each other than to the, um, you know, any of the other vertebrates, um, and that they were kind of this um, offshoot, this ancient branch that just died out um, eventually. But um, the kind of more recent consensus is, in fact that no, instead the um, placoderms, these um, basically these armored jawed fishes um, included the ancestors of uh, all living jawed vertebrates. So we are descendants from uh, of these placoderms. And uh, it's, uh, yeah, that's a, that would, that caused a really big kind of shift in the thinking of how uh, jawed vertebrates evolved. Um, and uh, it also has a lot of implications uh, about you know what the ancestral conditions were like in in jawed vertebrates, and uh, some of those were very much at odds with the traditional thinking. Although uh, we probably don't have time to really get into that here, um, so yeah, it is a really big deal, and um, it is um, absolutely fascinating that we keep getting these new finds that fill in more and more um, uh, pieces of the puzzle here, um, seeing the transition from these placoderms to jawed vertebrates as we know them. Um, I guess uh, just for the sake of completeness, there there have been a, a few recent studies, uh, like from the past few years, I suppose, um, that have still um, recovered results supporting um, placoderms as a clade, or at least most of them as a clade. Um, so that that would that would be more in line with the traditional thinking, where uh, you know placoderms are kind of their own group and uh, not you know not a not a lineage leading up to the to um, living any of the living jawed vertebrates um but uh I, I think it's fair to say that those studies are, are still in the in the minority um and that it seems um at least with uh, with a lot of the features we're finding in these uh, newly discovered species like this one as well as um, entelinathus from um, earlier um earlier discovered in uh in this decade um 
or I guess, yeah, this, this past decade, I guess. Um, uh, I, I think, um, you know, the, the pendulum really is, is swinging towards in this, this view that the placoderms are paraphyletic and, and gave rise to the living jawed vertebrates. And that, that is uh, really cool and uh, in many ways unexpected. Yeah, I mean, uh, it makes me think back to the stem lamprey study. Yeah, that that's right. With those larvae where kind of the image of the common ancestor of the various lineages leading to us mm -hmm. um, is going like, undergoing those those changes. I mean, us having evolved, I mean, like, like us having evolved from like a, a bony armored fish right. that didn't have a bony skeleton, you know, like, that's kind of a a funny thing to think about yeah <laughs> absolutely <laughs> and I, I, it's interesting too like you look at the placoderm radiation and then you look at earlier jawless fishes um like a, a stracoderm yeah. for example and you kind of see like where the the studies that are arguing for the paraphyle paraphyle show like it it makes a lot of sense yeah you know? i would I mean, agree a lot of these stracoderms were kind of bottom dwelling heavy armored fish and then you have some of these placoderms, which were bottom dwelling, heavy armor fish <laughs> that kind of show up on the lower end of the of the family tree. Mm -hmm. And you lead up to like more um, open ocean things like um, arthrodires. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, I can I can visualize it in my head. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, so that's pretty cool. Um, but uh, that's all I have to really say about that, unless we want to jump into the next one. Yeah, I guess we can do that. <laughs> So uh, we're going to stick with uh, fishes for uh, this, uh, this next story, um, but a very different type of fish and one that is still alive today, um, albeit it is one that is uh, uh, famous, I guess it, it is really the quintessential um, example of being a um, living fossil, quote unquote, um, and this is um, the coelacanth. Well, really there are, um, I think there are currently thought to be two living species of the mm -hmm. coelacanth, um, but this is the um, better known species that this study focused on, the um, West Indian Ocean coelacanth or African coelacanth. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I guess um, the coelacanth's uh, got a main claim to fame is that originally it was um, thought to be a completely extinct lineage. We knew about coelacanths from the fossil record, but they were thought to have gone extinct. Um, um, at least um, by uh, Western scientists until, you know, eventually it was found that, oh, there are no coelacanths living off the coast of East Africa. <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, it's, um, it's, a, it's a really famous story, um, but uh, I know a lot of um, evolutionary biologists are not too fond of the term uh, living fossil um, mm. because it, it seems to imply that, oh, these animals uh, haven't changed at all throughout their evolutionary history, which is definitely not true. Um, we um, actually have a huge range of uh, fossil coelacanths um, that are very different from the living form. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's true that uh, the modern coelacanth uh, does resemble uh, some earlier um, fossil coelacanths, and uh, and that we, we did think it was extinct uh, for a long time before it was found alive, but uh, it, it is a little misleading to use the term uh, living fossil or, or say things are, are primitive or, or ancient or, or so on just, just because of these phenomena. Um, so uh, yeah, that's a that's kind of a fun thing, but still, it's a it's a very cool species. Um, and coelacanths are um, more closely related to us than the placoderms were. Um, in fact, they are more closely related to us. The coelacanths are more closely related to us than, uh, say, sharks are or goldfish are. Or most of uh, you know the other types of fish that you can think of are. Um, they like um, land vertebrates are members of a group called the lobe fin fishes, or technically the sarcopterygii. Um, this uh, is a group of fish um, or a group of vertebrates uh, where their pectoral appendages um, have these uh, fleshy bases. And if you look on the inside, um, looking at the internal skeleton of their pectoral appendages, you'll see that the base of the fin or the limb is, starts out with a single bone, which then connects to two other bones, and then those connect to a lot of little bones. And that should sound very familiar because that's exactly the kind of... Um, uh, structure that we still maintain in our forelimbs and mm -hmm. in all the forelimbs of pretty much all uh, land vertebrates that still have forelimbs at least. Um, so yeah, uh, that is a, 
you know, a, a feature that originated in an aquatic kind of context, but it eventually was co-opted by our lineage um, to move around on land. Um, and so in that sense, you know, we, we share a quite, quite a strong kinship with the, with the coelacanths, um, both being uh, low-finned fishes, even though uh, we now live in very different ways. So the um, coelacanths, um, they, they don't really use their lobe fins uh, for, um, for walking around or anything like that. Um, what they do is they spend most of their lives down in deep water, um, and there they, uh, they have a pretty uh, kind of slow-paced and chill lifestyle. Um, their uh, their lobe fins are very useful for maneuvering, so they're good at like kind of turning around and you know, moving slowly through the water. Um, and they prey on smaller types of fishes; they're predatory. Um, but uh, they don't they don't live at a very fast kind of pace. And uh, this um uh, this new study uh, kind of shows us how true that is. Um, because uh, it turns out that uh, previous um, studies that have tried to estimate how long coelacanths can live have estimated that they only live for about 20 years. Um, and that would be very unusual for a kind of deep ocean, um, slow-paced kind of um, organism. Um, it would imply that they grew, that they grow very, very fast to their adult size, um, which uh, is really strange because uh, we think that you know they they don't really expend that much energy uh, and uh, they have very slow metabolism so what's up with that um so this new study uh took a look at um uh kind of, kind of revised uh our understanding of how long coelacanths can live and how fast they grow so um, as you might imagine, since coelacanths are normally found in the deep ocean, it's very difficult to study them in their um, natural kind of environments. Um, and I guess just in case you don't know what a coelacanth looks like, I put an image down here from Wikipedia on the bottom uh, left. Uh, so that is a model of a coelacanth showing how it appears in life. Um, a lot of the time you see pictures of them, they are uh, pictures of preserved specimens in museums, uh, but the uh, kind of really um, striking a uh, deep blue coloration really fades away in those specimens so I, I decided to show a picture of this model instead because that kind of gives you a better sense of what they look like when they're alive uh, even though it's uh, not a real specimen um, but uh, yeah it's very difficult to study um, them in their natural environment so uh, there is actually a lot we don't know about their life history um, so this new study uh, took a look at um, various collected specimens of coelacanths, uh, looking at 27 of them in total, uh, which is quite a lot for a coelacanth study, because uh, we don't have that many specimens of them. Um, and what they did was they looked at the scales of these coelacanths, and um, in a lot of fishes, um, the scales uh, contain these uh, lines, almost um, basically growth rings. As, as the fish grows, they add more uh, lines to their scales, and they were looking at these in the coelacanths. Um, now, previous studies that had concluded a maximum lifespan of about 20 years for coelacanths, they used a similar method too, but the thing was, it turns out what this study did differently was that they looked at these scales under what we call um, polarized microscopy. Um, and uh, what this means, well, uh, is basically um, when you're viewing things under natural light, um, that light um, is basically vibrating in all kinds of directions. And uh, sometimes uh, that can be troublesome when you're looking at these small objects and trying to make out minute details because uh, when the light is reflecting in all kinds of directions it kind of bounces off of many different uh, surfaces and uh, you know you get a lot of glare sometimes and that can uh, really obscure a lot of uh, detailed um, features that might be really interesting to find out about. And so there is a technique called polarized microscopy, where uh, you look at something under a microscope and the light um, that's being um, shown through the object uh, under the microscope uh, is what we call polarized. So that means uh, you put in a little filter and that constrains the light to only vibrate in basically a single plane. And so that removes all the kind of extraneous uh, reflections and things that might show up. And this takes me back to um, you know when I was doing my mineralogy class <laughs> as an undergrad and uh, doing my geology degree. Uh, we did a lot of um, kind of um, uh, um, looking at uh, mineral samples and uh, rock samples under uh, polarized light. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes uh, a lot of those features that we see under polarized light uh, can help us identify specific types of rocks and minerals. Um, 
But uh, in any case, this study uh, used that technique to look at coelacanth scales. And what they found was that uh, it turns out that coelacanth scales, uh, when you look at them under this polarized light, uh, actually have a lot more of these bands than um, had been previously recognized. Previously, um, they only found a few bands in these scales. Now, that's probably why um, coelacanths were only estimated to have lived to 20 years old, because there were only a few of these bands. But uh, under polarized light, it turns out that there were a lot more of them. Um, okay, so that's pretty interesting. So um, next what they did was that they wanted to make sure that these bands actually correspond to um, kind of yearly cycles. Uh, did these coelacanths uh, put down one band every year or, or what, because uh, that's not necessarily a guarantee. Um, so what they did to test this, uh, they actually did a number of things. They, they did a bunch of kind of statistical kind of um, uh, analyses to see what is the most likely kind of rate at which uh, these uh, bands were laid down. Um, but I, I guess uh, probably the most straightforward um, um, method that they use and the one that I'm um, going to talk about and show here is um, what they did was that they measured uh, basically the most um, the most recent band on every um, coelacanth scale for, for each of these specimens, um, and then um, basically based on uh, when each of these specimens was collected, so was it collected in January, was it collected in February, and was it collected in March, and so on, they plotted the size of the band against uh, the timing of when each specimen was collected. And what they found was that... Uh, in specimens that were collected during the growing season, uh, the bands were larger than those that were collected during, you know, what we could say the off season. Um, so in the middle of the year, basically, because they're in the southern hemisphere. Remember, the w winter time is, uh, you know, <laughs> in uh, the what we northern northerners would consider the summer months. Um, but uh, in any case, the uh, the bands were larger. Uh, when you expect them to be growing faster. Uh, and you can see this on the chart on the bottom right, and that, that's basically what this is showing. Um, they plot the, um, the size of the band on the um, uh, y-axis, and the x-axis shows the month at which each specimen was collected, and you can see a kind of very clear kind of pattern. Um, during the growing season, uh, the bands are larger, and during the uh, off-season, the uh, bands are much smaller. And so... Um, this uh, gave them, uh, you know, one of the lines of evidence to say that, yes, these bands were laid down annually. Um, so one per year. And so based on this, as well as the other uh, kind of statistical methods I mentioned in passing earlier, uh, they estimated the age of each of these coelacanth specimens. And it turns out that looking at all these specimens, all 27 of them, the oldest individual they found was not just 20 years old, but 84 years old. Um, based on the number of bands that it had in its scales. Um, and so uh, this is definitely a much longer lifespan than pre had been previously estimated for coelacanths. And it suggests that they could probably live up to maybe around 100 years. Now, we don't know for sure, uh, but uh, obviously it is very statistically unlikely that we have caught uh, the oldest known individual and just happened mm -hmm. to include it in this study. Um, so kind of... Uh, basically plotting age against size, uh, they estimated that probably the maximum lifespan of coelacanths is somewhere in the ballpark of around 100 years, which is pretty remarkable. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> um, something else that they found was that they had uh, their two youngest specimens that were just embryos um, were estimated at as being around five years old. Now, these are embryos. Like, they had not been born yet. So, yeah, that implies that a coelacanth's gestation period is at least five years. Um, yeah, that is. A... That's, wow, <laughs> that's more than an elephant. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> so yeah, very different kind of, very different kinds of implications from the old uh, 20 years estimate, that's for sure. Um, basically what this is suggesting is that coelacanths um, really do live life in the slow lane. Like, uh, it takes them over five years just to be born. Um, and as for uh, the time it takes for them to get to sexual maturity, what they did was that um, based on previous studies that it estimated, you know, how big a coelacanth gets before it gets to sexual maturity, they uh, um, basically plotted this onto their graph, uh, comparing size versus age of their specimens. And they found that uh, probably a coelacanth that has just reached sexual maturity um, 
would be around uh, 40 or more years old. So for males, they estimated um, somewhere between 40 to 69 years uh, to reach sexual maturity. For females, uh, between 58 to 66 years for sexual maturity, uh, which is, yeah, like imagine, imagine that. Um, mm -hmm taking so many decades just to reach sexual maturity uh yeah they really live life in the slow lane um so that that is uh, really incredible you definitely don't see uh, a lot of um, animals that take that long to to get to sexual maturity and uh, and then you know can can live for uh almost 100 years to begin with um so they wrote in the paper that this is one of if not the slowest life histories that has ever been recorded in a vertebrate um there are probably a, a few uh, comparable cases might be um the ohm the ohm is a uh, a blind cave salamander that lives in europe um and it is also thought to uh, live for you know around a hundred years or so um and uh, they also have a very kind of very slow and sedate lifestyle they they can they can survive without food for for like many many years and and all that so yeah another kind of very uh, slow metabolism long-lived animal that uh, lives at um, a very slow rate and it seems that coelacanths uh, seem to use a, a similar strategy so yeah that's a, <laughs> uh this is a really cool find so um you know even though uh, it might be misleading to call coelacanths living fossils in the sense of being, you know, exactly the same as fossil coelacanths, uh, may, maybe they can be considered living fossils in another sense in that they live for such a long time, right? <laughs> as individuals. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Gosh, I, um, that's so interesting. It, it seems like this is just like a really extreme adaptation to like its particular lifestyle, right. you know, being a, a deep, water living animal yeah um, where you know it's not exactly a mcdonald's on every at every trench you know it's gotta right <laughs> it's, gotta, it's gotta do what it can um <laughs> gosh like a uh, hundred years at least maybe um yeah that would that would imply that there are coelacanths that are still alive that were around when they were rediscovered that's right <laughs> <laughs> which is just kind of funny to think about um yeah, because that was uh, the 1938, I believe, when yeah. the rediscovery took place. Um, so, wow, yeah, <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah, I mean, it, it does kind of make sense too, like as far as like the deep water environment is concerned. Because I, I know there are like, uh, was it the Greenland shark? Yeah, the Greenland shark. shark. Yeah, that's, that's another one that kind of lives a long life. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, like hundreds of years. <laughs> Right, right. Um, of course, not, not to say nothing about like marine invertebrates, like oh, yeah. cobalt clams or the those uh, Antarctic sponges, which are supposed to be um, ten thousand years old at most, or something like yeah. that. I haven't <laughs> I haven't looked at those papers in a while. Um, oh, it's incredible the 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 life history. Wow, five year gestation. I, I'm <laughs> I'm just fixated on that. Right. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, I, I guess some. Um, because I didn't mention this earlier, um, coelacanths are ovoviviparous, um, which means that they don't um, lay their eggs, they retain their eggs inside their body and uh, the young hatch inside the mother. Um, so uh, they are born, um, you know, alive and well, basically. Right, right. It's like, it's like cheating at life. For <laughs> You're right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they, they don't have a placenta, but yeah, they do retain the, the eggs inside the body. <laughs> There's, um... I don't think I've ever thought about this. Does anything prey on coelacanths? That's a good question. Um, not that I have heard of, um, but I I would guess that that's just part of like the things we don't know about them. I guess, uh, yeah. Hmm, so I gotta wonder if like that would be a a good like adaptation towards you know the young being preyed on. It's like let me just hold on to them for five years. Make, yeah. Just make absolutely sure like they got everything they need. Before that's, they right. Get that's right. That's <laughs> right. Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, yeah, that, that could well be the case. It's just like, you know, make sure they are born very well developed and ready to go. <laughs> wow, that's fascinating. That's amazing. Definitely. <laughs> yeah, that was a really cool study for sure. Uh, it's always great to learn more about uh, this, uh, you know, you're still, still very mysterious species. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah, and I second the whole living fossil thing. I, I've just purged that from my vocabulary. Right, yeah. Because, 
yeah it, it just it doesn't make a lot of sense um i mean if you really like think about it a lot of animals today that we wouldn't call living fossils would be considered living fossils um <laughs> you know like a, you know, dogs domestic dogs would be living fossils and that's yeah that's kind of a <laughs> That, that term loses all its meaning basically right right yeah because yeah of course like yeah you know most of the species alive today have a have a, have a history extending back like you know at, at least several thousand years so it's like yeah yeah uh it, it is quite misleading to um a term so yeah i, I would also agree as well <laughs> definitely definitely um well i guess do we want to uh move on to the next study sure thing we can do that yeah i think it's another one of mine my second one mm -hmm. um you know we're still gonna be talking about fish but now we're talking about <laughs> the land fish. land fish yeah <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, of course tetrapods um now this isn't really a discovery or news so much as it's a a very needed review article mm -hmm. for a phenomena of biology which is always welcome in my book um, so John R. Hutchinson, mm -hmm. the author behind this paper, he studies evolutionary biomechanics, which is how mechanical laws affect animal movement through the ages. Um, he's written about the need for a good summary of information on different studies of gigantism you know, that, that have been kind of just scattered all throughout the literature. So they kind of condensed what we know in a single paper. So this is kind of a treat um, and, and a good read, too. Uh, now, gigantism refers to the process in which organisms grow larger than their average size, be they a single species or entire lineages. Um, this is often talked about in an anthropological context, uh, you know, with people who produce just a little too many growth hormones when they're kids, and then they end up growing up into Lady Dimitrescu. <laughs> now, uh, in biology, however, gigantism is used with all sorts of animals. And in this study, we're looking at large land-living megafauna that reach weights of a thousand kilograms or more, mm. the giants of the natural world. Um, at this scale, we see gigantism evolving more than 30 times in the history of life, uh, starting first in the Carboniferous and Permian periods when land animals were beginning to diversify into herbivorous and carnivorous niches and continuing on into the present day. Of course, the dinosaurs are famous for this. All of the major lineages reached such sizes, but other reptiles like uh, crocodilomorphs, snakes, and tortoises spawned their own giants. Um, on the mammalian side of things, true giants tended to be mostly herbivores with hooves or flat nails, but you know, there have been cases where carnivores like bears grew massive. Now, all of this diversity across some 300 million years is today just represented by a handful of animals, uh, mammals, uh, including the elephants, rhinos, giraffes, cattle, and the common hippopotamus. And uh, of course, we've missed many more giant animals by you know, a few tens of thousands of years, as we've discussed many times mm -hmm. before. Now, when researchers have studied giant animals, what kinds of trends have they tended to find and how their limbs have evolved and how they move? As may be expected, limbs tend to become more robust and thickly built as gigantism affects animal lineages. You know, they don't just become scaled up versions of their former smaller ancestors. Mm -hmm. That would cause serious constraints in terms of surface area, diffusion, and the like. Uh, Kurtz Kazak did a three-part video series about this that uh, we're going to have to link in the description. Oh, yeah. You know, they, they explain why, for example, you, you can't have an elephant-sized ant right. or, or an ant-sized elephant. Um, <laughs> incidentally, uh, there's also a TED Zoo article. Um, so we're going we're to mention tetrapod zoology again. <laughs> Take a drink. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, about, of all things, Godzilla and you know, you know, what could be said scientifically about him. Uh, and in fact, I made sure to get the specifics down about this. Uh, Darren Nash links to an article by uh, Michael A. Dexter that goes deep into the problems of kaiju physics. So we'll, <laughs> we'll post both of those two. But uh, long story short, you know, Godzilla would not be a thing that would exist. Um, the the constraints on his body would mean that if he tried to take a step, his limbs would just explode under pressure. Just so much weight. Um, just 
be impossible to breathe right. among other things uh, so yeah all that being said you know giant animals have to undergo changes in their bodily proportions if they're to survive at their size so that means thick bones to help support weight with the legs often shorter in overall length and these are supported by equally thick tendons and muscles and animal groups that stand upright develop much straighter postures as they grow and those that sprawl like lizards likely undergo similar changes but uh, this is admittedly an area of little study uh, one of the things about this particular paper that hutchinson discusses is that a lot of giant animals or have just not been extensively studied as others have been um, hmm. i think he mentions the majority of studies on giant animals today focus on like elephants and rhinos hmm. um, but uh they uh you know, very, very limited sample size we're looking at uh, now interestingly two factors become really important in determining how giant animals will move uh, first of all the feet of these animals have to undergo significant adaptations to deal with the stresses of supporting such weight uh, which actually becomes greater with increasing size so the bigger you get the more stressors are placed on the body uh, hutchinson specifically mentions subungular grade foot postures uh, which are what like elephants and camels have uh, where the foot is balanced on toes that are not quite hooves and there's usually a, a fleshy pad under the toes uh, that adds support as they move. Um, I've heard it mentioned uh, that if an elephant steps on your foot, it's actually much more soft and cushiony hmm. than, like, say, if a horse stepped on your right. foot, <laughs> which is interesting. Um, secondly, there's the issues related to neuromuscular control, you know, how the nervous and muscular systems work together. Now, this might be odd to know, but the larger an animal is, the more time it takes for its brain to receive messages about its body. Mm -hmm. Not by a whole lot, but it's still a noticeable number. Um, on average, a giant animal needs double the time to react to outside stimuli, especially when they're moving about at fast speeds. So as a means of safety, then, large animals have to sacrifice athleticism as they evolve lest they singe, uh, seriously injure or kill themselves making a sudden unstable move. You know, that's why, as a popular example, a Tyrannosaurus is not going to move fast enough to catch up to a Jeep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One, it doesn't need to because Jeeps aren't, you know, would not have been a prey animal they would have faced. Right. But probably more importantly, too, you know, if an animal that big tripped while running that fast, it would just never get up. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, uh, another curious aspect of giant animal anatomy is that different lineages tend to adapt a lot towards the problems of standing up and falling down. Mm. The latter makes sense, as I just mentioned, but the former is especially curious. You know, we find that many large animals have evolved ways of locking their leg joints, uh, as, as an example, which is you know, why you see cows and horses sleeping upright. For example mm. now as you can see then gigantism poses some restraints on how fast these animals can move now while this process doesn't produce uniform results there is a trend that can be seen where maximum speed declines as species become larger and in regards to the sacrifices of athleticism in the name of safety entire behaviors like jumping or running may be lost altogether mm -hmm. Uh, in Jurassic World, for example, the, the galloping dinosaurs, as was pointed out by paleontologists, would probably have been an impossibility. Um, but, you know, so is a leaping elephant that can run 64 kilometers an hour. Right. <laughs> um, now, Albert, as you had clarified in the uh, Forest Rocket episode, uh, giant animals may move faster than smaller ones, but only on a technical level because their strides are bigger. Mm -hmm. um, but there are limits regardless. Uh, in this particular paper, Hutchinson specifies that beyond a 100 kilogram body mass, maximum speed plateaus mm, yep. and then declines. And uh, so it, it's a curvilinear relationship between size and speed, not a linear one. Right. Discrepancies in size between different giant animals are always based on multiple, sometimes unique factors. But these, these trends 
generally follow. Now, the biggest problem in biomechanical studies like this is that our present day sample size is so small, as I had alluded to yeah. earlier. Uh, you, all we have are a handful of species, each of which is a hoofed or subungulate mammal. Uh, you know, when it comes to things like sauropod dinosaurs or Permian therapsids, we just don't have anything alive today that comes close to something like that. I mean, you can look at the image here from the paper at uh, our friend Patago Titan, mm -hmm. which would have been one of the largest of the sauropod dinosaurs. And then you see a giraffe and an elephant today. It's like, yeah, that's... I mean, <laughs> I, I, there's nothing like that on Earth. Anymore. Right. Yeah. You know, and that's especially true for giant bipedal predators, you know, like Giganotosaurus. Um, you know, the giants we have today can't teach us everything there mm -hmm. is to know about gigantism. So we're kind of left with the conundrum. Now, thankfully, there have been a decent number of studies done on extinct giants, and many of them give a taste of the diversity in megafaunal biomechanics in regards to the giant theropods for example the research indicates that although they couldn't move particularly fast they may have been able to take short runs if they shifted their limbs upright in a particular way mm -hmm. that's one interesting example um, but even with studies like this uncertainties remain you know despite the homologies in vertebrate animals we don't know just how much the muscle mass was for some of these giants and there are still some questions about proportions that have only recently been studied i mean i think about some of the dinosaurs i grew up with that were so sleek and thin in their reconstructions hmm. and it was only within the last decade at least that you know i'm starting to see reconstructions that are giving dinosaurs more mass yeah you know, especially in their necks and tails and bellies but even so whatever studies we have are important steps in truly understanding gigantism and the constraints it places on animal evolution all in all hutchison writes the circumstances that have produced giant animals were pretty much environmentally specific and even if different animals reach their enormous sizes in different ways gigantism has tended to produce similar constraints almost every time uh, but similar doesn't mean simple mm -hmm. uh, hutchinson closes the article with this a nuanced approach to the evolutionary biomechanics of land giants is important for unraveling the perplexing mysteries that they continue to pose. So, yeah, that's, um, I thought this was a wonderfully fascinating paper. And of course, it's linked in the description as well. And it goes a lot deeper into some of the specific problems and, and solutions in studying gigantism. But uh, that's all I have to personally say on this. Mm -hmm. Albert, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, sure. Um... Uh, so I'll uh, clarify beforehand that I haven't um, read the whole article, but uh, I do think it's really nice to, to see um, this article written and being published because, um, of course, uh, kind of giant body size in animals is definitely a topic that has fascinated people um, you know, since forever, probably. Um, definitely uh, one of the most um, interesting things to a lot of people about um, Mesozoic dinosaurs is how big they got. And yeah, uh, uh, it is really interesting to see um, all the all the um, shared trends um, in gigantism um, of different lineages becoming uh, such giants, but also the differences as well in how they uh, um, uh, the biomechanics uh, a change. Um, and yeah, it's um, it's really great to, to see this review paper. Um, and John Hutchinson is definitely a, a giant in the field, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, you, you know, there there aren't many people who are going to be uh, going to be a, a better choice for writing such a review paper. Um, and yeah, it's it's really great. Um, I guess um, something else I'll mention is that uh, since you talked about um, uh, the speed at which kind of signals um, do the nervous system travel and how that can be an issue for giant animals, um, you might have seen this in uh, you know various pieces of pop culture. The idea that uh, say giant sauropods um, you know wouldn't feel uh, something biting them at the end of their tail until you know it was too late or something like that. Uh, right. Yeah, it would take them several seconds or minutes before they realize that. Um, so um, I. I don't know of any um, actual like uh, peer-reviewed studies uh, actually showing that, but uh, there is a really nice blog post um, 
uh, on the uh, sauropod vertebra picture of the week blog, uh, which as its name suggests is uh, primarily written by a, a couple of sauropod specialists and um, yeah, sauropod researchers. And they, they have actually done a blog post about the subject. Uh, how likely is it that, you know, the, these, uh, the, the speed at which uh, nerve signals travel um, was an issue for, for giant sauropods, uh, which is really cool. So I'll, I'll have to link that in the description. Um, and uh, but I I think the, the basic take home message is yeah it would, it would have been an issue but not to the exaggerated extent that you see in pop culture which is probably what you'd expect uh, obviously sauropods would not have lasted very long if they they really uh, you know took that long to to respond properly to a threat so um, yeah uh, uh, definitely uh, check that out I think if you're uh, curious about that subject. Um, and uh, kind of the last thing I, I have to mention, uh, or at least immediately comes to mind, is that uh, this diagram that you show on the slide uh, with all the skeletons kind of running or walking alongside each other, um, this was done by Oliver Demuth, um, who is currently one of my lab mates. Uh, he is a fellow PhD student at the um, at Daniel Fields lab here. Um, but for a while, he worked as a research technician in John Hutchinson's lab, which is probably why he was asked to contribute to this paper with this diagram. And he's he's an amazing uh, an artist, as you can see. Um, and uh, currently, uh, he is uh, bringing his biomechanics expertise to studying um, um, kind of the function of um, extinct um, early birds for his PhD. So uh, yeah, I'm really excited to see uh, where he takes that. Um, and yeah, uh, really, really good pick choice of paper here. I think this uh, might, I'm not sure, but I think this might be the first time we've covered a review paper on, on the show. Um, oh, I don't, I, yeah, that, that sounds about right to me. Probably, yeah. And um, no, I, I think it's, I think uh, review papers are, are great uh, in, as, as a concept. Um, at least that does not to say that necessarily every individual review paper is great, but uh, uh, definitely, um, you know, they, they may not be um, uh, reporting new discoveries per se, but uh, oftentimes uh, if you want to know kind of the latest uh, uh, science, uh, the latest scientific consensus or the recent advances um, in a certain subject, uh, review papers uh, are a great place to go to, to find out all about um, that. Um, and so uh, it's always really nice to see a very uh, well-written uh, review paper coming out, um, especially about uh, subjects that uh, uh, you know, <laughs> are, are of such broad appeal. So uh, yeah, I, it, it is really nice to, to see this. Definitely. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I certainly in the field of paleoanthropology, there have been a number of review articles that have come out that have been enormous help mm -hmm. <laughs> in figuring out the state of the field. So yeah, I couldn't agree more on that. Um, I think what fascinates me, and I know this paper didn't exactly cover it, but just like the solutions to, you know, growing to giant sizes that like say dinosaurs faced versus man. I've always thought that was an interesting thing because yeah. I, I believe it's the sauropods and the theropods were the ones that had the hollow bones. That's right. And that kind of helped alleviate some of the weight as the lineages grew over time. And in many cases, um, they had the, or I think in all the cases, I forget how specific it is, but like they had the system of air sacs in the respiratory system that mm. helped provide oxygen. That sort of that unidirectional breathing where they're just taking in air. Yeah. Um, ah, it's just a remarkable solution to <laughs> the problems of weight. Cause uh, I mean, they certainly would have been enormous animals in weight, but right. <laughs> these probably were not like hundred ton giants that all the classic books had talked about. Mm. Um, you know, they probably would have been a lot lighter than that, but still significant at least. Oh, of course, so, yeah. <laughs> so I always thought that was pretty fascinating. Because, yeah, like with mammals, they have more solid bones. Right. And so there's sort of an upper limit to giant size that has seemed to have kind of plateaued a bit among certain lineages. Like, I believe, like, if you wanted to ask me, like, what, what was the heaviest um, land mammal on Earth, I think... It's currently tied between a number of proboscideans, yeah. so the elephant line organisms, as well as uh, um, endricotheres, yeah. which mm -hmm. were members of the rhino lineage. Mm -hmm. and, uh, usually they get the title of you know, biggest land mammal, but as I understand it, like they kind of share similar dimensions with each other. Yeah, that's right. And so it's kind of difficult to say. Now, of course, like a question like that is always tough too. You know, what is the largest of anything? Because it's yeah, like yeah. Okay, 
what do you mean? Do you mean by weight, by length, by height? Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> there's different factors that weigh into that. Um, granted, it's not exactly an important question, but I mean, it's still significant in that it tells us a little bit about the limits of yeah. gigantism. Mm-hmm. So, Indeed. Mm-hmm. I, I always thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, this is a this is a huge topic. I, I, I'm I'm sure someone could like teach a course about you know uh, the biology of giant animals because there's there's so much to cover, um, and yeah, there there's a whole mountain of literature just talking about how sauropods, um, well, like din- dinosaurs in general, but especially sauropods because they they got so much bigger than everybody else. Um, uh, how they were able to get so big, and why why don't other groups of animals get so big uh, at least on land? Um, so yeah it's it's a it's a huge topic and uh, there's a lot that we could say about it but um i i think um i, I think uh it definitely would be quicker to to just link a, a review paper or something in the in the description <laughs> oh definitely definitely um yeah and of course as is mentioned in this paper like there's a lot that we don't know mm-hmm. um, yeah. mm-hmm. like i think specifically Hutch- like in one instance hutchinson mentions that there's like next to nothing on um on studies with the crocodilians and and, and their giant size yeah um, which is kind of important because like they don't we don't get crocodiles that well crocodilomorphs that big anymore um Mm -hmm. they all kind of like all the ones alive today kind of hover around like the 20 foot mark at the very most um but you you go back into geologic time we had some pretty hefty giants yep Mm -hmm. um i think the most familiar one is probably sarcosuchus which Mm -hmm. was from the the early Cretaceous of Egypt, I believe. Yeah, North Africa, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah which um, had a really funny long snout with a bump on its head, mm-hmm. kind of looking like a like an Indian gorille, but yeah. mm-hmm. he was super scaled up. Uh, that animal is just impressive. Super croc from my childhood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, Albert, Albert, you're definitely right. Um, I mean, we, we'll have to move on, but... Oh, we could easily do a whole episode or a whole lecture series if we wanted to. Right, um, gigantism, just uh, oh, so many stories. Titanoboa, <laughs> um, uh, the giant marsupials. Yeah, um, I mean, and this is all concerning land animals too. That's I mean, right. I, I think it's safe to say like gigantism in the sea is a little bit easier to explain because the water takes up most of the weight, and so that's why you can get whales that are just so big. Yeah, compared mm. to land animals. Even then, there are there are like um, uh, interesting stories with whale evolution because like the the gigantic, the really really big whales are a relatively recent kind of thing. They they didn't, it wasn't like right. the whales kind of just enter the water and right away they became uh, this big. Yeah, they like the really big uh, things like blue whales and such. Uh, they they didn't become so big until relatively recently in geologic time, and so probably there were a lot of environmental factors that might have come into play that allowed them to get that big. Right, right. Absolutely. Um, of course, that's to say nothing about all the giant sharks that we used to have. Um, yeah, you think Megalodon is special. No, no, no. Uh, that that was just the end of one larger phenomena of giant sharks, mm. or giant predatory sharks in the oceans. Yeah. Um, when I was in the Florida Museum of Natural History, they had a whole case full of them, um, all the way back to the Eocene. So they were like a major uh, major part of the ocean food chain. Definitely. Yeah. Oh, just so many good things. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I guess, uh, I guess, uh, shall we move on to our final story? I guess we could. Yeah. <laughs> All righty. So uh, we just talked about some giant animals, but now we're going to get small. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. So we're going to talk about Australian rodents. Uh, yeah. Okay. So that might not be, uh, you know, two, two words that people often put together. Um so the kind of, um, I guess, cliche is that most Australian mammals are marsupials. And, of course, uh, there are also a few monotremes that are only found in Australia. And people just think of Australia as this land of marsupials with uh, basically no placental presence, uh, or essentially no placental presence, and at least until humans brought a bunch of introduced species. Um, mm. But uh, that's not really true at all. Um, so it turns out that there are 
there is actually a great diversity of um, Australian rodents, and not just a few species either. Like they account for uh, a quarter of all living Australian mammal diversity, a full quarter. So yeah, they uh, Australia is uh, not just a land of marsupials. Certainly, marsupials are very diverse in Australia, but um. You also have the rodents, and of course, you also have the bats as well, which are also quite diverse. So, in the end, the split is you know a lot more even than a lot of people uh, seem to think. And uh, if people have heard of rodents in Australia, um, it's more than likely that they have heard instead um, not of the Australian native rodents, but of the mouse plagues that happen every now and then in Australia, mm -hmm. which are quite unfortunate. Um, basically, um, in years when the grain harvest uh, is, uh, you know, when the, the grain harvest is really good, um, uh, there are... Um, house mice in Australia that uh, explode in numbers and just kind of uh, get everywhere and are, are make, you know, are, are huge, a uh, huge nuisance. Um, uh, but house mice are not native to Australia. Um, house mice were, were introduced later by Europeans. Um, so they are one of the non-native placentals that were brought to um, Australia. But uh, there is, in fact, a huge diversity of like actual native Australian rodents that got there uh, without human assistance and have diversified there for quite some time. Um, so, you know, you almost never hear about them, uh, but they're out there and a lot of them are in danger of um, extinction. And in fact, um, many of them have gone extinct already. So. Um, at least 14 species of native Australian rodents are thought to have gone extinct in historical times. Um, and that accounts for 41%, like almost half of recent Australian mammal extinctions. So mm. yeah, um, kind of extinctions um, in recent times have really hit the Australian rodents quite hard. Um, Australian rodents are very diverse, like even though they are so um, obscure. Um, so you have a few um, semi-aquatic species that are uh, mostly um, kind of um, mostly carnivorous. They hunt around in waterways. They catch uh, things like crayfish and uh, clams and um, all kinds of uh, uh, other aquatic prey. Um, something pretty interesting about um, those uh, semi-aquatic Australian rodents is that uh, they are among the, um, the few um, Australian predators that have learned to hunt um, cane toads safely. So uh, cane toads are an introduced species to Australia, um, and they have uh, made a huge nuisance out of themselves by, uh, first of all, by eating pretty much anything smaller than themselves, um, which of course is a huge danger to a lot of the smaller Australian species, but also by being kind of deadly poisonous to Australian predators. So um, carnivorous animals that eat cane toads in Australia uh, because they hadn't co-evolved with such a, with prey with that kind of toxin, um, yeah, they, they often die. But um, some of these Australian rodents have actually figured out how to eat cane toads, and what they do is that they will actually um, uh, attack the toad's underbellies where the where there aren't any poison glands and then eat them from the underside um you know out and leaving kind of skins behind uh, it's kind of morbid mm -hmm. but uh you know it is a pretty effective way of dealing with that uh, that's pretty cool um there uh there are a group of um uh australian rodents called the stick nest rats um uh, which build these huge nests out of sticks, uh, like just giant piles. I can get like oh I don't know like uh, like two meters wide and a meter tall or something ridiculous like that. Um, there are uh, um, some rodents that live in uh, arid environments um, called the pebble mound mice, uh, which uh, have a really curious behavior where they pile up uh, these pebbles around their burrows. And uh, I think it's not entirely um, clear what the function of uh, these pebble mounds are. Um, so. Possibly it might be uh, for defense. Uh, predators can't get in as easily. Um, some people have suggested that they might uh, help collect uh, dew um, in the mornings. Uh, they trap moisture in there, so uh, you know uh, it's a pretty handy thing to have in a desert. Um, and yeah, lots and lots of different um, Australian rodents um, that just don't get any press at all. Um, and that that's really unfortunate because, of course, you know these are endemic Australian species uh, that are native to to the continent and uh, they deserve just as much conservation attention as all the other uh, very beloved um, kind of Australian creatures do. Um, mm -hmm. And so 
it is really unfortunate that they have suffered so much from uh, recent extinctions and yet uh, have not really gotten much uh, um, recognition in popular culture. I spoke, um, I think, in the last news episode about a, a book I used to have as a kid um, um, about um, Australian mammals. And, and it, it was written by an Australian uh, mammologist. I think his name was um, Ronald Strahan. Um, I'm not sure if I'm saying his name right, but um, I know he passed away around a, a decade ago. And um, yeah, he, he wrote this, um, well, he wrote many books, but the book I had was a, a book of poems about Australian mammals. So it was a, quite, quite an interesting format. Um, and something that was quite nice about that book was the fact that it, it wasn't only about, um, you know, really well-known kind of Australian mammals, but it also covered some uh, rather obscure species as well. And that included, uh, it had a few poems about um, various Australian rodents. Um, and so one of them um, was about uh, one of those semi-aquatic rodents. So in fact, it is, um, I, th I think it's currently the biggest uh, rodent that's still living in, in Australia, um, the so-called um, Australian water rat. Um, Hmm. Yeah, uh, and so, in fact, uh, I might remember that poem so well, I might still be able to recite it, um, so let me try. Um, so it, it is, uh, this particular poem is written from the point of view of uh, the Australian water rat, so it is written in first person, so and let me think how it goes. Um, let's see. I live beside a water hole, an inland river, or a creek. My upper fur is dark and dense and waterproof and very sleek. My belly and my chest display a hue of yellow or of gold. So millions of my relatives were trapped and then their skins were sold to make smart coats for you and yours upon the supposition that fur's better on a human than an unrespected water rat. Who cares Aww. what happens to a rat? the words enough to damn one's soul, you could have named us otherwise, perhaps, Australian Water Vole. But rat's the name you gave to us. Before your people came along, the first Australians knew us well as Palarail or Tularong. Koala, Bilby, Potoroo are creatures you appreciate. I wonder if with names like Lairs, we might have had a better fate. Uh, and yeah, that's the that's the end of the poem. Oh yeah! <laughs> wow, I, I still remember. It. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it really highlights something, right? Like uh, you know, these these um these animals they are called mice and rats, and that that's not um, entirely inappropriate because uh, they they do belong to the kind of bigger clade of mouse like and rat like rodents. So they they are closely related to the kind of typical rats and mice that you think of, um, but uh, they are definitely uh, very different in their you know, ecology and habits. They are they are not um, you know human commensals that often uh, make, are, are pests, um, and uh, they are certainly very um, important in their natural environments, uh, kind of being notable uh, not only predatory forms but also uh, seed dispersing forms, and um, also uh, of course prey for uh, native predators. Um, and it, it that that poem really does highlight uh, the fact that uh, people have a really bad association with the word rat. Uh, mm -hmm. um, and um, I guess somewhat um, happily is that uh, the um, Australian water rat, at least, um, um, there has been a, a push to uh, um, call it by uh, one of its uh, indigenous names, uh, which um, in this case has turned out to be uh, the Rakali. Um, so uh, currently, uh, I think the more commonly used name for this species is now uh, Rakali and not the Australian water rat anymore, which is uh, you know, pretty nice to see. I, I do appreciate it when people you use indigenous names for, for uh, these uh, endemic species. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, fortunately, the, um, the Rakali um, is not one of the um, uh, species of Australian rodents that has gone extinct. And it, it is now protected and is uh, doing reasonably well, I would say, uh, as far as Australian rodents go. Uh, mm. fortunately, uh, you know, that, that, um, the aftermath of that poem does, ha does have a happy ending, I think, at least for now, <laughs> but, um, uh, nonetheless, uh, there have been a lot of Australian rodents that have gone extinct and it's not even, 
you know, all these, it's not even like all these extinctions happened a long time ago. Um, so in fact, there's a very recent example of an Australian uh, rodent that has gone extinct. Um, it was last recorded in 2009, I think, and that is the uh, Bramble K. melanese. Um, so it lives on a, uh, well, a K is basically a, a small island that's formed out of uh, materials originating from a coral reef. So uh, basically the skeletons of all the uh, various animals that live on the coral reef kind of piling up into an island, basically. Um, the Bramble K, that, that particular island that we're talking about, you know, is found uh, somewhat north of um, Australia. Um, and there used to be a, a native rodent that lived there called the Bramble K. melanies. Um, but uh, since 2009, there has been no more sightings of that, and it has officially been declared extinct. Um, and almost certainly the reason that it's gone extinct is because of climate change um, um, causing a sea level rise that uh, periodically floods the islands and, of course, destroys the um, habitats uh, of, this, uh, of this Australian rodent. Um, mm. And so... Yeah, this is a really, really recent and ongoing thing. It's not not just stuff that happened a long time ago. Um, and in fact, I think uh, the Bramble K. Melamese has been considered um, kind of the first documented example of a mammal going extinct due to climate change. Um, and uh, well, I, I fear that we're probably going to get more examples, you know, in the not too distant future if we're not careful. Um, so yeah, it's really sad. But um, certainly uh, this new study uh, on Australian rodents, and especially extinct Australian rodents, uh, gives us some new insights into um, uh, the extinction of uh, many of these species. So it's quite an important study, I think. Um, so what they did was that they sampled genetic sequences from uh, 50 species of Australian rodents in total. So yeah, see, see what I said about them being very diverse? There, there are 50 species of them included in this um in the study, and that's not even all of them, um, including eight of these recently extinct species. Um, and so uh, they analyzed these genetic sequences, did a phylogenetic analysis to find out how all these different species are related, which is the kind of graph that I'm showing here. Um, so uh, for most part, in terms of like the actual phylogeny, there weren't too many uh, big surprises. Like there, there were a few species that didn't, didn't quite go uh, exactly where we might have expected based on previous studies. Uh, but in general, uh, uh, the uh, overall kind of uh, uh, phylogeny was pretty consistent with what we had known. Um, however, uh, there were a number of like quite major uh, discoveries that uh, the researchers made uh, doing this study. Um, so first of all is that uh, it turns out that one of the supposedly extinct species of Australian rodent uh, is not actually extinct. Um, so they found that um, a species that has been called Gould's mouse um, is in fact a very genetically similar to a species of a living Australian rodent called the Jungari. Uh, so that's another indigenous name. Um, now, uh, what is... Um, very um, notable. So I guess for, first of all is that um, uh, not only were they um, genetically very similar, like well within the range I would expect uh, of being the same species, but also uh, they also looked at uh, um, physical specimens and found that morphologically they're essentially indistinguishable. Um, so they suggest that the uh, Gould's mouse and the Jungari should be considered the same species. Um, in which case, um, because the scientific name of the Gould's mouse, Pseudomys uh, gouldi, um, was named first, uh, it should be used as the correct uh, scientific name. Um, but they did recommend that in terms of common names, that maybe we should um, continue using uh, Jungari for this species, uh, just because mm -hmm. it, of course, uh, has seen a lot of recent usage uh, for a living species. And so it's probably most convenient to do that. And, uh, you know, I, I'm certainly on board with that, especially since, again, it is an an indigenous name. Um, now, uh, even though uh, they found that the, um, the the species of mouse is not in fact um, extinct, um, it has undergone major kind of uh, population contractions. Um, basically, the only reason that it is not extinct is because the Jungari uh, still survives on offshore islands uh, off Western Australia in the Shark Bay area. So one of its other names, in fact, is a Shark Bay mouse. Um, and it is only because that it lives on these, uh, also lives on these offshore islands, um, that was able to avoid a lot of the um, uh, factors that probably cause the extinction of 
um, uh, other um, Australian rodents, because it used to be that uh, Gould's mouse slash the Jungari uh, was also found on the Australian mainland, and that, that's the reason why it was thought to be extinct, was because uh, Gould's mouse was the name being used for the mainland kind of populations, um, and it's true that the species is extinct from the Australian mainland. Um, so even though it is a quite a happy discovery that uh, this is not in fact an extinct species, uh, it's still a kind of um, gives us a warning, I guess, uh, that uh, these threats are very, very real um, to the Australian native fauna. Um, and that it was only because of um, that its population extended uh, to these offshore islands that this species has been able to survive. Uh, fortunately, um, uh, on these islands currently, um, the Jungari's populations are relatively uh, stable at the moment. Um, like the, because they are such small populations, they do have to be monitored. Um, but uh, in general, they're, they're not like teetering on the brink um, of extinction, so that is good. Um, something else the authors were able to um, um, a study uh, um, was uh, genetic diversity um, of extinct um, Australian rodents. Um, and so they basically looked at, uh, you know, in the, um, the specimens of uh, extinct uh, rodents that they sampled. Um, and what they found was that a genetic diversity in these extinct species uh, at the time when those specimens were collected uh, was actually very high, uh, like they weren't unusually low. And so what that tells us is probably that their extinction was really fast. Um, so usually if an extinction kind of happens over a protracted period of time, you'll get, you know, the population gradually shrinking and shrinking and shrinking. And one of the side effects of kind of getting a really small population um, is kind of this reduction in genetic diversity as more and more of the, um, you know, the species is wiped out. But uh, apparently uh, there was basically no time for this effect to be uh, registered in these um, Australian rodent species. Like they just Went, went extinct like in a in a blink of an eye uh, basically mm -hmm. um so uh, very shortly um after a uh, uh, european uh, arrival to australia um and yeah pro probably a lot of factors went into that um, habitat destruction and also the introduction of invasive predators that prey on these rodents um they, those are probably uh, some big ones and so yeah definitely um another uh, uh, gives us some other insights as to how these um, these rodents went extinct and the fact that they can go extinct so quickly. Um, and something else that this tells us is that uh, being genetically diverse uh, is not necessarily protection against kind of anthropogenic causes of um, extinction, um, and neither is even uh, having a large population size because like um, Gould's mouse, for example, was used used to be found like. Uh, in quite a wide range across Australia, but now it has been extirpated from most of it. Um, so, yeah, uh, being genetically diverse and having a high population, the lows aren't necessarily um, uh, strong defenses against uh, a human impact, which is uh, uh, concerning, but uh, it definitely also helps us um, conserve uh, species if we use this information wisely. Um, and lastly, uh, they also tried, tried to uh, look at uh, whether there were other um, factors that were correlated with um, um, extinction risk in rodents, uh, these Australian rodents. And first of all is that uh, they found that large-bodied rodents are at greater risk of becoming extinct, which is somewhat expected. Um, in general, large-bodied animals tend to be um, at greater risk of extinction uh, than smaller ones. Um, and also, uh, it turns out that Australian rodents that live in um, arid, so dry environments, or, or mesic uh, environments, which are kind of um, uh, environments that get a moderate amount of uh, rainfall, but not a huge amount, um, are also especially um, susceptible to extinction. Probably uh, these habitats are especially vulnerable to um, anthropogenic disturbance. Um, whereas um, it turns out that um, rodents living in um, uh, relatively wetter habitats um, uh, tend to be uh, tend to do better um, at least in recent times. So uh, yeah, that's a uh, that's a pretty interesting finding, and again should be uh, quite informative in helping a conservation efforts. Um, so yeah, that's a uh, those are pretty much the main findings of this study, um, and uh, I I do hope that uh, studies like this really bring greater and more widespread recognition to Australian native rodents because they they really need better press, and um, I, it is a real shame that. Uh, that people um, you know don't know them so well, um, like not not just uh, 
because of their intrinsic value, which all organisms have, but um, also because uh, it is a really, um, I think it's a really missed opportunity, I guess, to get to know these creatures because uh, they, they are actually really cute. <laughs> I, I think uh, a lot of these uh, small rodents are really cute. I, I think uh, people have this, uh, you know, they have this stigma against uh, rodents uh, because of uh, the kind of you know, pest species that we're familiar with. But uh, like even even like a typical rat, you know, like they can make really affectionate and, and uh, adorable pets. Um, and certainly a lot of these um, Australian native rodents um, they have these uh, big, you know, big uh, dark eyes and uh, big ears, and uh, a lot of them are really fluffy. And yeah, if you go go and look up some photographs of, of these rodents, they are they are adorable creatures, and I think they could be uh, great ambassadors if people gave them a chance. So, uh, yeah, the um, it's always nice to kind of spread the word of Australian rodents. Uh, what do you think? No, I definitely agree. Um, I think studies like this, for sure, as far as understanding where our wildlife are going to be regarding anthropogenic climate change in the next couple mm. decades. Yep. Mm. Um, super important. Um, I mean, yeah, arid or mesic habitats. Well, you know, that's, there's probably gonna be a lot more of that fairly soon. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's not uh, particularly encouraging to hear. Right. Um, but, uh, important nonetheless. Um, but no, I certainly agree. Um, I think Raya rodents in general, it's kind of one of those things where we hear a lot about people complaining about conservation groups where they have like charismatic animals, mm -hmm. right? And they're usually like big fluffy megafauna or like elephants and stuff. Right. Um, and I suppose an argument could be made about rodents too, but they don't really get a lot of press regarding no. conservation as yeah. far as I know. Um, yeah, they're fluffy and they are cute, but because of the association with words like rat and mouse, I think that definitely contributes to a lot of it because you know, you hear the word mouse or rat and it's like, Oh, I mean, I've seen mice and rats before they're everywhere. Right. They're going to be doing just fine. Why should I worry about these ones just because they live in Australia mm -hmm. or just, you know, on some Island somewhere. And it's like, well, no, they are, they're, they're, they're very important and they're nothing like the, you know, the introduced species that we have. Right. Uh, as, as you, as you mentioned, um, no, so I, I totally agree with you on that. Um, yeah, it's very fascinating to kind of see a study like this. And also, I, I just love the whole thing about, oh, this animal that we thought went extinct is actually still around all this time. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> um, rather than being like a, like a, a Lazarus taxon situation, mm -hmm. it, it, it's like, oh, this species actually belonged to that one the whole time. That's um, right. Which I can't. I can't think of the last time that happened on like a species level. Um, hmm. The only thing that comes to mind, and maybe this is not like the best example, but there was that study a couple of years back about the pygmy right whale. Oh yeah. Being, turning out to be a member of this huge extinct group of baleen whales called cetatheres. Right. But I don't know if that's been, if that's remained as it is, or if there if there's been more discourse on that. Or yeah, I, I've heard that it's it's a somewhat uh, it's a rather controversial kind of a uh, finding. I think uh, like I, oh, you know, yeah. I I'm not I'm not I'm not very involved in the um, the whale uh, systematics uh, field, but uh, yeah, that, that's what I've heard. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, but uh, yeah, beyond that, it's like hmm, right. like nothing else comes to mind. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I'm not sure what the last time was either. Um, but it, it is it is kind of funny uh, for uh, for this episode because yeah, like like I um, like I commented to to you um, earlier in the week, but you know not uh, just for the for the sake of uh, the audience here. Um, uh, yeah, like it, it was it was uh, not planned, but it turned out that both of um, my stories that I picked uh, for this episode have to do with Lazarus taxa, and uh, the a Lazarus taxon is back basically. Um, um, it's basically a, a species or, or, you know, any taxon that we, we thought any group of organisms that we thought was extinct, but was then discovered alive. Um, and of course the Lacelacanth is a, a classic example of that, but, uh, yeah, uh, this, um, because one of the results of this study is that the uh, Gould's mouse is actually not extinct either. Um, and so, yeah, there's another example of a Lazarus taxon and, uh, it just happened to be the, the two stories I picked uh, for this month. <laughs> Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that would be a Lazarus. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, Lazarus taxon, that's so funny. The, <laughs> the, the names we give yes. biological phenomena. <laughs> right. Uh, very fitting, for sure. All right. Um, 
So yeah, I guess um, that concludes all the stories that we picked for this episode. Um, so I guess should we uh, do the closing uh, material? <laughs> sure, absolutely. Alrighty. So, um, as always, we would like to thank our friends Henry and Alicia for their contributions to our show. Uh, the show definitely wouldn't be the same without them. Um, and uh, if you enjoyed this episode, you can follow us on uh, Twitter. Uh, we always tweet whenever we upload a new episode. And uh, you can also uh, subscribe to our YouTube page where you're probably watching us right now um, if you enjoyed this episode. Uh, so you can uh, keep uh, directly up to date whenever uh, we upload a new episode. Um, if you have questions about anything we talked about or about the show, uh, you can email us at timeinclades at gmail.com or you can leave a comment. Uh, we do enjoy receiving those. Um, and as always, uh, we will include links to all the papers that we talked about um, in the uh, in the description for this episode. Um, all right, so um, next week, uh, wow, um, next week is going to be a really uh, special um, episode, really, um, because we are going to finish up with your series on human origins. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, um, it'll be the finale episode, episode wow. 13, Lucky 13, um, <laughs> Humanity of Prologue. Um, yeah, we're going to be basically kind of looking at the present day and like the factors that led into, you know, our current world situation. Um, you know, some, some of the cultural evolutionary changes that humans have gone through in recent years and also kind of take a look at the future and see some of the discussion that's been had about where our species may go, if it'll go anywhere. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, definitely deep episode, I think. Yeah, won't exactly be a woohoo episode right. because um, I, I would I will also be kind of outlining the state of the world regarding the uh, the environmental crisis. Mm. So that's a that that'll be something. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, I think it'll give a little bit more perspective and appreciation to the story of humanity, and uh, I hope you all will join us for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely, uh, it'll be a very important episode for sure. But um, until then, uh, please take care, everybody, and stay safe, um, and we'll see you next time. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us, and take care. <laughs>